I was born in Fresno, California in 1945 and uh, I'm the son of a lifetime artist, a watercolor artist, who painted 20,000 watercolors in his life, 98 years. And my mother, whose family was from the South, and she, uh, she worked in the Air Force craft factories, you know, like women did in the Second World War. So I grew up there, man, in Fresno, California. I just taught myself to play saxophone. And uh, the band director already was aware of me. I played violin when I was a kid, but I didn't want to play violin anymore because the tough guys would beat you up, if, you know. So I ditched my violin he said, Look, why don't you take up another instrument? I hate to lose you. And then he let me take home instruments in a band room and learn to play trumpet, trombone, baritone, horn, bass, guitar. I learned all of those. He'd say, hey, here's a trombone. Why don't you take it home? Learn to play it this weekend. By the time he came back, I could play it. So that summer, I got a saxophone of my father's out of the attic and learned to play it, and so then I played saxophone. That was kind of a guess. Yeah, I took up every instrument, piano, and uh, so I can actually play every instrument but drums. I can even play tuba, but I haven't done that in years. <laughs> One time they picked me for All-America High School star jazz band, and all the saxophone places were taken, but they wanted me to take sax solos, so I said, well, I play guitar, and so I, put, so I played rhythm guitar until it was time for a saxophone solo, and put the guitar down, picked up the horn, did that. It was always easy for me to learn instruments, you know. And here, the past 24 years, probably I've made more of a living as a piano player than a horn player. But uh, this year, since I've been back, Five years since I've been back from Kansas City after Katrina, I just play saxophone after playing the piano. It's great. Oh man! First things I liked was New Orleans rhythm and blues. I liked Fats Domino, Little Richard, Earl King. That's the first stuff I listened to. And it's funny. I went to hear Little Richard in person, and the saxophone player got up on the piano and laid on his back. I said, "Oh man, I got to do that." And later I met him, man. He was one of my mentors. With was Roy Guitar Gaines, a blues musician from Los Angeles that's still going. And I was his brother Grady on saxophone. When I met Grady, he was driving a van out to the Houston airport and back. But I want to do it like Grady. I want to get up on the piano and lay on my back. And so that went for a while. I was first a tenor player, played tenor saxophone through Jackie Wilson. And then when I was with Jackie, we went out one day and he bought me a record. It used to be those 10 inch records because he knew I had a little record player, plastic thing I carried with me. He bought me a record, Charlie Parker, playing uh, the tune Bebop. Man, I heard that, it went nuts. I said, I want to be able to do that. I want that. I said, Jackie, let me play alto. He says, no. If you bring an alto in here, I'll fire you. I hired you to play tenor. <laughs> so he actually bought me my first Charlie Parker record. He said, you're gonna like this, Don Ranger, you're gonna like this. Jackie was, uh, was real musically aware of a lot of guys. Leroy Jackie Wilson. He was a good mentor, man. I was playing at a place owned by Wayne Cochran and the C.C. Riders 
on the 79th Street Causeway. And uh, he had Jacob's stories to Ben. He was saying, you kept hearing, oh, it's great bass players when Wayne comes back and plays a club. It was Jocko. So I got to know Jocko, and I was sitting in with Jocko and Ira Sullivan, some of the jazz cats like that. But then I got the house band gig at the Continental Club down to end of 62nd Street. And it was the biggest club in the ghetto. It was like everybody dressed real nice and had barbecue. And they were doing the alligator, and it was a classy place. And all these name rhythm blues people came to the showroom upstairs. Jackie came. Tyrone Davis, you probably don't even remember these names. Barbara McCacklin, Tyrone Davis. And I was downstairs with my band, which was called Lone Ranger and Tonto. And at Soul Riders, I wore a white cowboy hat, black mask. And my friend Pete, who was Mexican, who looked like Cochise, you know, he wore a Tonto band. And Jackie Wilson came downstairs on his break and he laughed, man, he cra cracked him up. He said, look, I'm going to hire you guys, but if I ever see that damn cowboy out of that Indian headband, you're fired. <laughs> so Pete and I went on the road with him. I was 18 years old when I worked with Jackie. We flew, we drove, we did buses, we did, you know, and it was basically what they call a Chitlin circuit in the South. You'd be, when we came to New Orleans, the first time we flew across the lake in a private plane, over there somewhere, and it was like a barn in the woods. And uh, Jack was saying, be careful, man, they practice food all over. <laughs> and then we worked at 333 St. Charles, which is a theater up in that building. It's a Masonic hall. And we worked there, and uh, I don't, everybody was excited. Jackie was getting everybody excited. And the white couples and black couples started dancing on the floor together, right? So uh, the cops saw that. He didn't like that because the blacks were supposed to stay up in the balcony. So he tried to grab the microphone from Jackie to get him to stop. And that was the right, wrong guy to do that to because Jackie was a boxer, man. He fought Sugar Ray Robinson. When he was young, he lost. So how long did you last, Jackie? Two two rounds, and boy, he gave that guy a, a right hook that was memorable. And the cop was big and fat. He went down. Of course, then they landed on top of us. So we all ended up down at Central Lockup, and they took Jackie in the back and beat him up. So he came back, his face was all messed up. He just put on makeup, went on to the next gig, never mentioned it, you know. And they let us go. We were just stooges. But actually, at that time in the South, there was a law against black and whites working together, which Sarge had to let me know. We could arrest you, you know. Driving to a gig in Montgomery, and we used to take the back there weren't big interstates in those days like this. We took the back roads on purpose. And some guys in the pickup truck started uh, following us and shooting at the bus. And it wasn't good because the engine is in the back in those buses, you know. And uh, they shot out the back window and we all hit the floor. And then and they had shot out one tire. And... Uh, so the bus driver pulled off the road like this, quite a ways off, and then he circled around. That was interesting, like this. He parked like this. And the reason he had done that was to give Vernon, the road manager, some cover so he could go back along the bus without being seen by those guys with a 12-gauge shotgun, and he shot him. And we got back on the road. We were scared shitless, man. We thought we were all going to join for murder. I didn't see it happen because I was on the floor of the bus. <laughs> I was on the floor of the police. I don't want to die. And uh, I was strange. And we got to Montgomery and backstage, Jackie said, uh, I heard about what happened, man. He said, you okay, Lone Ranger? I said, yeah. We did what we had to do. Those guys were 
out to, ki you know, kill us. One night in Mississippi, we made the mistake stopping the diner, all went in. And of course, they all split immediately, the cooks, the waitresses. So the guys went back on the bus, and I stayed there. And I remember saying, I'm going to get 35 cheeseburgers. Because we are traveling on the bus with the Chai Lights in those days. And a group called the Prolifics. <laughs> they were good guys. They had all just got out of prison. They're the ones that named me, go get us, Paul. Because then whenever I needed food, we pulled in a place. I went in, bought 20, 35 cheese. It's good to have a white guy in bed. Go get us, Paul. <laughs> And Jackie's musical director, Truman Thomas, phoned me up and he says, I'm going to form a big band in L.A. We're going to do soul shows at the Palladium, Hollywood Palladium. So I drove out there to California, to Los Angeles. Lived in a hotel and we had this 18-piece soul band. It was a great band. And we backed uh, Tyrone Davis, Barbara McAcklin, Little Dion, the Chai Lights, and then Jackie was one of the artists. And he didn't know. He knew it was Truman's band. He didn't know I was there. But he came out on stage doing his, throwing his coat over his shoulder and to drum kicks, you know. And he saw me and he went like, he said, Lone Ranger. I take him over and gave me a hug. That was nice. I worked with T-Bone Walker for two years. That was significant to me. We did college concerts in California. I worked with uh, an old group called the Shirelles from the 50s. I worked with Lou Rawls, uh, the Pointer Sisters. I subbed with Ray Charles Band. I did three gigs with Ray. I'd been in the folk scenes for a minute, playing with Hamilton Camp, opposite Tom Waits, Cheech and Chong, Jackson Brown. These guys weren't even known in those days. And the show got picked up to go to Broadway. So that sort of ended my LA context because I left and I had a baby on the way. And so it was great to go to Broadway. We did two shows on Broadway. We did Paul Sills Story Theater, which was uh, Grimm's and Aesop Tales, acted out with no sets, just mime, uh, colors, Actor spoke in the first and third person. It was a big hit. And then we did a second show concurrently of Ovid's Metamorphosis, Arnold Weinstein's adaption of it, which is the story of Juno and Jove and Pygmalion and, you know, all the gods and all that. So I did the music for that. I actually won Tony for the music. But I was there for a couple of years. My baby was born. I was making big dough, you know, it was great, man. We played on stage for every show. We had a band on stage. And it was really fun by the time second show because I'd written all of that music. You know, one of the actresses in the show, man, was Valerie Harper. She's a real good friend, terrific friend. And she said, oh, Lauren, she said, me and Dick Shaw, her husband, are breaking up. We own an apartment on the west side, penthouse. You want to come see it? Because I know you've saved some money. She took me up there. It was a penthouse apartment. I said, how much, Val? She said, 80000 And, you know, if you give me four grand or something in front, it's yours. God, do you know what that would be worth today? And I like truly in the folly idiocy of my decisions said no i'm gonna buy into this commune in virginia <laughs> which i did the interesting commune the arquettes were there you know the actor arquettes all those kids patricia and all them were little kids and and i bought this commune we built the geodesic domes that blew over in the first storm you know and didn't buy that that new york apartment which was really stupid Stupid man. <laughs> Valerie hired me on her show in Los Angeles to do the music. She was under Mary's umbrella, so I sometimes worked the Mary Tyler Moore show, the Rhoda show, I worked the Bob Newhart show, Paul Sand show, and a show called Doc. Those were all out at Universal Studios. 
And we played while they were changing sets, and I played on a couple of recording sessions and stuff. But uh, Valerie's a good friend. I played the blues for years. I, playing with T-Bone, I played a big blues festival in 1989 at Long Beach College with Albert Collins, Albert King, Otis Rush, Etta James, Roy Gaines, and the four horn players were me, Ricky Woodard with Ray Charles Band, Buster Cooper with Ellington, Oscar Bashir has been with everybody. And we just played behind every act, made up lines, and you know, played that the intro to to At Last. And I knew Etta from years before because we'd gone to the club and Etta liked a little taste, you know. And I had said, hey, I don't care, and give her a little matchstick, a smack, you know. I went to Denver with Chet at a club out in Denver, and uh, we did that club. I don't know how many gigs it was, maybe 17, 18 gigs. And it was a beautiful man. He was the most focused musician I ever played with. He had ability to put everything every bit of focus. In fact, he said one time to me, he says, the difference between us men, you're a give a shit musician, and I don't give a shit. He says, you care what Leonard Feather, the famous jazz critic, thinks. You worry whether I like you, whether the famous drummer likes you, Harold. You worry what, you know, you think about how can you impress the chick in the first table. Row. He says, see, I don't care about any of that. But think of all the attention that leaves me to put on the music. I was a very valuable man. I was getting like to study painting with Picasso or Franz Klein. And oh, if Chet Baker just hadn't been such a dope. He said no. So without the dope, there'd be no Chet Baker. That's my deal with life is I get to take all the dope. You get to listen to me. <laughs> Which I dug. I'm so glad he was an apologist about it. Yeah, I was uh, a junkie <laughs> when I was a kid. When I first got out of uh, CYA, I went to San Francisco and lived in North Beach and the hotels and got strung out, got busted. And in those days, you could either take your bust or you could go to Sinan. So I went to Sinan. I was a Sinan facility facility in Salinas I went to and <laughs> have to go through sin on you never take drugs again because you don't want to have to do that again that's <laughs> so I only had one further incident with drugs in the 90s a girlfriend left and I knew the connection and so I got strung out again but that time I said wait a minute man your kids don't want you to be junkie so I had a gig over in Monterey, so I just went over and kicked by myself in a hotel room. But yeah, in, in those days, everybody took heroin, and heroin was a drug of choice of jazz musicians. It was part of the culture, and almost anybody you can mention back from those schools was in the heroin. Cocaine really hadn't showed up yet, except for speedball. So. You know, I felt bad, like, once when I was strung out, I lived in a hotel in North Beach, and I stole ladies' TV, old lady, pensioner. And so I felt so bad, man, that I went out and bought her another TV and left it by her door. You know what I mean? I just wasn't comfortable with that. And I made this album called Song for Blue Planet. Uh, real good reviews in Downbeat, just... And then the, the company um, released the second album on it. That one got nominated for Jazz Grammy in 1990. And they had the most famous, most recorded jazz drummer in history, Billy Higgins on drums, George Cables on bass, John Hurd on drums, and got five stars in Downbeat. It was really going. Columbia Records got real interested in it. And they flew me to New York. I'm up on the 64th uh, story of the 
Columbia Records building and with George Butler, who signed Harry Connick, Winton, Marcellus. And he said, I really liked that record, Lauren. He says, I want to sign you in November. So I go home from New York. We went and saw Around Midnight together. I goes, I said, I'm going to be famous like Winton Marcellus, which me meant I could work and support my family and travel. I was like, he even put out a magazine article, said, this year I'm signing three guys I consider masters of the idioms, but they're expanding the idioms. It was me, Charles Moffat, a bass player, and Benny Green, a pianist. And I showed my mom, she said, look, look, it's in the paper, George is gonna sign me. So he was supposed to meet with me in LA in November. We did, and he said, look, man, Sony just bought Columbia. And basically what happened is they had a meeting because I was presenting your record as the one I wanted to put out on Columbia. I'd recorded it already. And he, they said, look, we want to sign this guy, Tim Burton. He's a fashion model, done some modeling on Lori's side. He's young, he's a kick-ass looking guy. Uh, Lauren's kind of like approaching middle age and he's a little bit overweight and he's white. And George would say, no, yeah, but Lauren can talk, man. Has a lot to say. It didn't matter. They signed to him. But uh, that was kind of, was a, that was a disappointment because I, I felt like it was almost there. And after that, I said, okay, well, what are you going to do? Oh, same thing, play, practice do music. But that was kind of the end of my big ambitions. And eventually I got a job at the gazebo, which is out, you know, across from the French market. And it was every day, six days a week. And we were making ridiculous bread. So I started working steady with John, just me and John, at Storyville. So I was working there four or five, six nights a week. I was working at the gazebo. And I started to look at my money. I said, Jesus, man, I'm making like 900 a week, $1,000 a week, and I was packing it under my mattress, you know. I was in heaven, man. I had a rooftop apartment with antique French furniture, 300 a month. And while I was up there, the office that rented those apartments was downstairs and Sheila worked there in those offices. So I was paying her my rent. That's how I met Sheila. And she, Sheila and I fell in. She said she wanted to live in Tennessee Williams' apartment that he wrote Streetcar in Summer and Smoke in. I said, sure, 600 a month, up some stairs from the street, kitchen, bedrooms. Big, long French room with fireplace at each end. His grand piano, the Orline game, we moved in there together. So we actually lived up there until the ceiling fell in. <laughs> Sheila and I have been together 22 years. And uh, it's the nicest relationship, man. Once I met Sheila, I kind of knew that was it for me. Well, first of all, we all evacuate hurricanes in the summers. And, but Sheila ran into the hurricane guy in the halls. And he said, this is serious. This has come this way and it's big. So she came home and told me, I said, ah, it's just a little bit of wind and rain. But she convinced me we should go. On TV, the flood had begun. The levees had broken. So one of the shots was of my neighborhood. I said, holy mackerel, I guess we don't have a home to live in anymore. So we went to Kansas City. Didn't really mean to go to Kansas City. I was going to turn left and go across the country to California where my people were. But my axle broke. Both axles broke. Boy, it was a disaster. The car fell apart. So we had to go to the shelter. The FEMA shelters then get her two thousand bucks and spend it all on the car. Nineteen hundred dollars fixing the car. So I said, I guess we're here. 
and then the American Jazz Federation was helping us out. We were going out to old folks' homes and schools and doing music and getting paid well for it. We took a band to Europe, a, a Kansas City All-Star Band. We played J. McShann, Charlie Parker, uh, oh man, it was the other great band leader. But I finally came down to the point he had no work, not a gig, six months. You know, I was applying for gigs like sitting in the rental car station, little cubby hole at night in the freezing weather, being a guard. And January 11th, it was cold and freezing. It was like 10 degrees. I said to Sheila, I gotta go home. <laughs> And when I came back, I said, I don't care if it's a fucking tsunami and one square foot of ground to stand. I'm never leaving. This is where my home is. And I'm going to stay here until a tsunami washes me away. When I came back from Kansas City first night, I walked into DBA. And John said on the mic, he said, one of the elders of New Orleans music is here. And I want you to give him a big round of applause. I guess a big standing ovation. I said, I think I'm home. <laughs> See, John had come back after the storm from Brazil. Frenchman Street was barren, nobody. And John just went into DBA, said, I want to sing. Got a chair, sat on stage, started to sing a cappella. A couple of weeks later, Todd came back from Chicago. When I came back, I was added to the band. Bass players, <laughs> trombone players. So that's a wonderful gig and wonderful musicians and a great association. I love that gig. Even though it's been five years, I'm going to make this album with all of us from Dos Efes. This is a tune called Prince of Hearts that I wrote for my oldest son, Michael, who passed away in 2013. And that might be the, the um, lead tune of the album. And it's also to commemorate the friendship between Eric and Wendell and I, that you guys caught the other night. Me and Eric and Wendell are dynamite together. <laughs> I want to like play one of the best solos of my life and just have a big, huge fucking cardiac. Speaking, I always told Pete Harris, the bass player, that. I said, Peter, when I die, it's going to be of a cardiac, and I'm going to land right on your bass and bring it to the floor and crush it. I promise you I'm going to do that. So on gigs, sometimes I'll fake a heart attack. I go, uh, 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 and I like to watch Pete because he goes. <laughs> it means a lot to me to be considered a New Orleans musician after 20 years of being here. To be thought of as one of the elders in New Orleans music. Mm -hmm.